Hi, everyone. Welcome to Open Social Expert Panel Discussion on uh, Gamification and Community Engagement. Um, I hope you're looking forward to what promised to be a very interesting and thought-provoking discussion today. Uh, first, I introduce myself. I'm Jamila Khail. I'm the Customer Success Manager at Open Social. Uh, ignore the bell, please. That's what happens when you're in home office. <laughs> um, and I'll be your moderator for today. Uh, for those who don't know who or what Open Social is, I'll just give a brief uh, definite. It offers uh, Open Social offers to open source and kind of an out of the box online community engagement solution for organizations such as United Nations, Greenpeace, Salvation Army, and many more uh, to help them manage the online community members. Uh, the reason why we also wanted to host this specific uh, panel discussion is because we recently launched the Open Social Gamification Extension uh, that's powered by Thanks. And we thus are very excited about the interesting applications that new gamification innovations have for community engagement and like how interesting technologies like blockchain can be applied to these community engagement. However, without further ado, let me introduce to you our amazing panel guests. Uh, first of all, our very own Moritz Arendt, our project manager that led to the conceptualization and implementation of the gamification extension uh, on open social that's uh, powered by Thanks. Uh, speaking of Thanks, uh, Mieszko Szczek, who is the founder and the CEO of Thanks. Uh, what is Thanks exactly? It's an innovative tech startup from uh, Amsterdam creating next generation gamification systems uh, using blockchain technologies. Uh, Miesco also has over 12 years of experience in open source technology. Uh, speaking of 12 years of experience, uh, Belinda Jacobs is also here with us. She's a self-described gamification wizard <laughs> with over 12 years of industry experience. Uh, she's the founder and managing director of Subatomic, a Dutch gamification consultancy that specializes in creating behavior change and engagement. Um, but last but not least, Zach Onogola, who is the information system specialist at the United Nations Development Program. And he's the one who liaisons for the Spark2 project, which is in progress, actually, of implementing the gamification extension. Um, Open Social also helped launch the UNDP Spark Loop platform in 2020 to create like seamless connections and dialogue and ideation across all UNDP platforms. Um, you can see all their names, I think, below in their image, so you know who I'm talking about. Uh, everyone will have a different person, a different screen, so it doesn't really make sense the point. <laughs> um, but today, our four expert will be talking about, obviously, gamification principles and best practices, uh, really some interesting innovations happening in the gamification space. Um, um, and of course, how gamification can be practically applied with online communities to increase member engagement. However, I just wanted to like disclose before we get started, I just want to mention the session will be recorded as Mowens pointed out earlier. We'll also be conducting polls throughout the webinar to help guide the discussion. Uh, so keep an eye out for those. And uh, at the end, uh, you can also post Q&A uh, uh, questions, uh, post questions in the chat as we'll have a Q&A session at the end for the last like five minutes or so um, to discuss further. Um, so, um, yes, all about gamification, we start here. Uh, gamification is obviously a sort of term that's kind of thrown around. Um, people just think of like badges and point earning systems. And that's pretty much what I thought of gamification to myself until I've dived a little deeper. Um, but kind of now to the, pa the palace, what a vision of gamification um, uh, what is your vision of gamification kind of beyond that, right? Or beyond just like these badges that are there? Uh, Melinda, maybe you could start? Yeah, sure. Um, well, to me, in a weird way, I would say gamification doesn't really exist because it's not necessarily a, a new approach or not a, a specific framework or methodology within itself. But what I see it as is an observation that games are really good at creating engagement. And when we say gamification, what we're trying to say is, hey, we recognize that the way games are designed and the fact they're looked at as, as a whole complete system, that everything, all these little last details are, are designed down to the very simple, how do you jump in a world or how do you move about or what's the narrative? And what we try to do is say, all right, we, we have an intention now to design in a similar level of detail, design in a systematic way uh, as games do. So to, to an extent, I would say it's, it's a bit of, of a, yeah, 
approach or an outcome goal, but simply you could say also it, it's system design ultimately. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mort, how would you say? Yeah, I, I, I can see myself really in that. Um, so I have a, I have a, a, actually a psychology background. So for me, gamification is also like, a, like really connected to this behavioral aspect of people and about triggering people, showing uh, uh, to, to, to perform behaviors uh, that are beneficial, that are commonly defined as beneficial, that stimulate like positive uh, behavior on platform, especially in the context of communities um, where you can use like those, this knowledge of how do people react to positive and also negative reinforcements from psychology, which is really well researched. Um, how can you use those principles in a, in a the quite still new environment as online communities? and how can you benefit from the knowledge that we have gained over the last 60 years or so in behavioral psychology and apply this these principles to this space yeah and how would you see that more zach now with your for example online community and implementing that yeah i think coming from a, from the perspective of someone who manages an engagement platform for policymakers these are people that live all over the world different cultures they're normally typically very busy and they're you know they're, there's a the space is crowded um in terms of where do we spend our time and and in our work as a, as a whole um for about 10 years or so our team has managed various engagement platforms we run e-discussions we run various uh interactive modules to try to get people to uh, share their expertise share their knowledge and what we landed on pretty early on was that incentive to contribute um, you have meetings with various teams across the board and it's always, it's something that typically we have to introduce to, to these policy teams. You need to think about the incentive to contribute. You cannot have an interaction just because it's there on the screen. Um, you cannot expect people to join unless you truly create that incentive to generate, like prove that there's impact coming. Tell me why I'm here. Tell me how long I'm going to be here. What am I expected to do? All of the above. Did you just also like, go deeper now into what gamification really is or did you always have like previous knowledge or did you really dive now more into it regarding related now to the UNDP platform also? Yeah, I think gamification as a, as a term, it's maybe been around for a few years. I don't think we've purposely implemented something on any of our platforms in, until now that's like truly in the guise of gamification. Normally we call it a needs assessment. Normally we try to find those same triggers and those same uh, reasons why you should should be there but this is like with, with thanks very specific technology that really is gonna kind of I think sharpen and, and make us focus a bit more in terms of how we uh, design those incentives in, within the community. Yeah. Mesco, how do you now see that that with thanks now with gamification kind of obviously also evolving and changing? Mm -hmm. Well my perspective on it is you know more of a business perspective I see these beautiful business cases where it really helps achieve people uh, reach some goals, right? And those are some very impressive numbers, like 20, 30% increase in engagement or uh, learning goals of all kinds of things that people would like to achieve in online environment, but also offline. So, you know, that, that really is something that uh, triggers me. Uh, and also from a personal perspective, I, I thought I was a like pretty rational guy, but I'm uh, for, for, for some while working on Reddit, I'm reading some groups there. Suddenly, I'm buying these badges for like real money and giving people like uh, virtual okay, you know, and I'm and I'm loving it, you know. So it is is powerful. So even on a personal level, it does engage me, if you will. Mm -hmm. Well, you just said you're coming also from like a business perspective, right? Well, business, when you think about gamification, it's more like, right, like you win prizes or you win like money to extend, right? Kind of in that way. Um, so what's kind of the difference between applying gamification for like monetary and like versus non-monetary kind of purposes? Yeah, you know, that's a very deep question. Um, you know, I both can work. I think yeah. we are in the experimental phases of using monetary incentives. I think mm -hmm. that's very uh, complicated to get right. Um, but it's again, it can be very powerful. So within the blockchain and the crypto movement, the idea is to, you know, align economic outcomes with, uh, with, you know, with all the stakeholders and provide the right incentives on an economic level to, to achieve some goals. Um, obviously, there could be problems that this could be gamed or abused or what have you not. 
uh, but still, there are a couple of examples that this works really well and could be a you know very powerful tool to also do good, right? And to uh, have, let's say, incentive to to reduce the CO2 usage or stuff, stuff like this. This this is not way out there. This is happening today, right? So you know, I think the possibilities are very very you know big uh, in that way. For for me, I think it's it's it's. Uh, I agree with Miesko on that that it's. Um, it's like experimental and to, you have to see how you balance it out. But in general, I, I think it's really just another set in the toolbox of gamification. Like, yes, it is from a, from a, from a um, business perspective, it's a very interesting point. If you also think about other like frequent flyer mice or something like this, which are de facto monetized gaming uh, structures. But I think it's, it really needs to be applied to the use case. So I'm not, also not sure like how Zach or Melina who, who are really, in this space and see a lot of more different use cases in that regard, how they think about it. But I think it's like, it can be very powerful in some cases, but also actually detrimental in other cases. So it really needs to be applied as a tool in a, in a, in a box and not in the toolbox and not as like ultimate goal of gamification to monetize something. But if in an NGO sector, your, your goal is to have more engagement then maybe you, you don't want to bring money to the table. Melinda, what would you say about that? Yeah, I mean, you know, rewards, of, of course, like anything else, it's, it's a transaction. You know, what you're trying to explain with a reward system is this behavior is valuable. So it's either going to help you because it creates meaning for yourself or it's going to help you because you get something outside of yourself. Like in this case, that would potentially be monetary. Um, and I, I think, you know, if, if you're really looking for behavior change at the end of the day as the reason for your gamification, uh, it's important to not get too lost in external rewards or building only relying on that because ultimately you're not really changing behavior at its core, which is where like the person really understands and gets, okay, why am I doing this? Why would I want to do this? What, what's really, what happens when I do this action? But instead they think I want to get a, a Euro or I want to get this one thing. So I'm just kind of going to mindly do this. And in some cases that's what you want because it is a mindless action or action that you want it to be repetitive and just done and so hey that's great but you know if it's more on that side of we really want to educate people we want to motivate people we want to take this narrative and make that narrative more interactive so people see how all of this actually works and we build this system around it to teach you about that and to convince you of that then it's better usually to step back from rewards a bit and maybe look more towards social signifiers or other forms of, of recognition as a reward as opposed to, to fiscal. Yeah. Well, Zach, would you kind of agree with that, that that's kind of what you're also hoping then to achieve in the community wise? Like to really, as Melinda said, like, right, making it not really just reward and fiscal, but really pushing towards uh, it being more that people are like uh, educated further from that. I think, yeah, definitely. We. I mean, we, we, we talked even around some of our brainstorming sessions around the potential of a currency um, and the concept of impact as currency rather than actual monetary value. So what you're trying to strive for is actual substantive contribution to these communities um, in terms of the sort of creating the, the wrong incentives or the wrong reward pools. You can see that quite a bit. I think it's some, some find within this piece of work I think naturally one of the first things we thought about implementing was some sort of leaderboard, just who, who contributes the most on the platform. In my mind, that might not necessarily be the best incentive. You might end up, you know, finding the loudest in the room, but are they actually substantively contributing to these conversations? Um, in our field, we have, you know, very career-minded people. We have, we have um, people that really do want to stand out in these, in these types of places, see their expertise come to light, share their expertise with others. Um, and I think, yeah, like the, the design of this and, and thinking about it as impact as currency, but maybe not even impact as currency, just creating those those right right sort of reward systems to truly guide the through, help them substanti substantially contribute to a conversation and not overload, overload the conversation, I think is key. Yeah, I think that's also something very interesting that Zach mentions that like you create those value-based systems, right? I think this is something that's often overlooked if you talk about gamification as an incentive tool is that 
like how those incentives are defined um, is something that comes then from the people who are implementing the gamification method. So it is not only, especially from a business perspective, not only interesting to look into, oh, can I increase engagement um, or can I bring people to like more or to perform action X, but also what can you gain from a community management aspect? Right, because at the moment, yes, you have KPIs. You can look at how much has been done, but you can, with a gamification structure, you can actually attach a certain value to an action and can make this in, that can can create an insight in this for community managers that can then drill down in, into these leaderboards, even if you have them only internally, and show like, okay, this person is in a certain topical area very very active is like creating a lot of value to people and i think it's also something that can be interesting to look at into how you can um like a filter down on those values that you can get from the data you generate with it but also to to make a differentiation between a value you generate through frequency of action and through actually like evaluation of action so a like is not a like but like maybe a like on a certain content type is way more worth because people just see this content as more important than other actions on the platforms. So you can go really deep in a set of value and then in the defining what something worth on your community. Absolutely. Like I, I think that's one of the biggest challenges with the word engagement. Because what does it really mean at the end of the day? You know, it's not just about getting people active on your platform, but like you were saying is, you know, what is it that you want them to, to actually be doing? What does that mean if they're doing that activity? And, you know, how does this fit into that bigger picture? And I think a lot of get caught up in, you know, I want to increase engagement. So I'm going to use gamification. And again, they don't think about, okay, but what would adding uh, rewards or a leaderboard or points or, you know, uh, a playful narrative or collaborative goals, like what's this doing? You know, if you need cooperation, adding a leaderboard for engagement is usually a bad idea because if it encourages individual competition, you're not ultimately going to get what you want. Uh, I had a use case once that was for car sharing and uh, for a company. And what they wanted is they wanted more people at that organization to carpool together to work. So what did they do? Well, they created a leaderboard. They created a reward system. If you're a driver and you have more passengers in your car, you're going to get rewarded. Well, you know what that system actually did, even though it sounds like, oh, great. Yeah, great incentive. It created drivers, not passengers. But what they really needed is they needed more passengers than drivers. And that's a perfect example of why just that engagement approach alone or just focusing not on what you're really rewarding can sometimes end up backfiring and not get you really that outcome you're looking for. Yeah. Yeah, we also have an actually interesting question coming in that I think really fits this is from Antonio. He said, like, using gamification for training purposes is powerful. However, introducing it right to an organization will need to overcome taboos because, like, top management sees it as, like, oh, employees spend time playing games. That's how they will learn. Like, how can you overcome then this perception um, that kind of comes through with that, right? Like, explaining it also to people who aren't also very well in gamification. Um, who would like to start? How about uh, um, Niesko, what do you think? Well, you know, obviously I think you need some buy-in from uh, top level management, you know, to, to, to introduce such systems because it, it will have some effects, uh, bad and good. Um, if it's a very big to-do, I, I think you need to have like a, you know, a Kumbaya session with your management first. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but after that, you know, uh, I think there are enough business cases now that some of them speak for themselves. Like if you look at the well-applied results, they are so, can be so impressive that it, you know, it will convince this top management. So first think about what you want to achieve. Look at similar cases, you know, don't try to reinvent the whole wheel uh, and start simple. And I think you should be okay. Uh, hmm. Yeah. I think, I think from my side and coming from an organization that is, pretty hierarchical, relatively traditional for the space. Um, the, the danger there, I, I think surprisingly so managers will understand the concept of gamification. It's not necessarily that they're worried about staff going to play games, that, that type of thing. But the pitfall that I do see over and over again is about 
the numbers, the focus on numbers, what, what types of sort of increased incentives on the other side to, to continue down a certain path because you're getting celebrated by management because your, your engagement is increasing in a certain community versus another because you're being recognized as a top contributor, et cetera. I think that's a really easy pitfall to jump into pretty dangerous when, when management gets involved from, from that side of things. Cause they're busy. They're they're They have a thousand things to do every day. They'll get a report that does have some numbers on it and then expect that there's better numbers next time. So. Yeah. Um, since we're already talking also about like myths and concept, uh, like misconceptions, Milena, what would you say have you like seen the biggest one so far that you really had to like persuade to overcome a client about? Oh, that's a, that's a good question. Um, I, I think mostly actually it's, it's adding achievements and adding leaderboards and adding like the basic mechanics of just, okay, you know, gamification, even though there are some, some systems that it's like, just add a achievements and it will work. You know, these, these tools that allow you to technically do this are very useful, but just adding in the design principle isn't always uh, so beneficial. So I think a lot of times uh, when I come in a room, I'm combating either everything in the platform now has to be super fun and do crazy things. And we're going to throw in Easter eggs everywhere and <laughs> achievements for everyone. Yeah. Uh, and it's often explaining, well, actually, gamification can sometimes be really boring system design. You know, it's about coming in and saying, all right, what's the activities here? You know, what do these activities mean to your narrative or to the big picture? And maybe let's do less badges because really if people don't care about the badges, if they don't have a social meeting or an individual accomplishment meeting or a reward meeting, uh, people just don't engage with them. They aren't just engaging by default. It's, it's as uh, earlier panelists have also said, it's, it's about that meaning that's there. So yeah. I think that's probably uh, the one. <laughs> yeah. That's really great, um, especially now we've also touched upon the topic like Zach mentioned that like in the it's only a new concept right the 2000s and so forth but gamification has exist let's say the beginning time in the early 2000s uh, and has like evolved around now 2010 even more and increased and so forth um, now also to. Uh, um, kind of during all of you, like how has uh, tech and gamification technology really like changed now in the recent couple of years, actually like the most, right? Has the biggest impact. How has it like evolved to back then to now? Um, so yeah, yes, go. Yeah, perhaps Guy, I can uh, give a quick comment. So I think this is something similar to what we see in, in software in general, right? And maybe Melinda can confirm, but what I've been seeing is there's a lot of this used to be like a custom development. Right. So so uh, especially bit, like bigger sized organizations, corporations, they uh, they read the buzzword, you know, gamification and decided that they want to, that, that they want it. Right. For for good reasons or bad. It doesn't matter for this uh, story. But and then they start building from scratch. And this is uh, it might work, you know, but it's uh, slow and expensive. Um, and, you know, the last couple of years, this all turned into SaaS. Right. So software as a service. Um, and these can be like gamification engines, uh, referral programs. I think somebody in the chat mentioned the uh, HR apps and uh, recognition in those. Mm -hmm. um, they are like an app for everything, right? So this is nice. It saves you a lot of time uh, and it's much you know, cheaper to start, mm -hmm. right? You just buy an account per person or whatever and you, and you can start. But it's usually limited to one platform, like it locks you in into this HR app or maybe uh, Air Miles, right? It's also mm -hmm. gamification. But, it, but, but um, so I think the next generation is, is really like API and integration driven. And this is something we see the last, I don't know, let's say five years, maybe even uh, less. And we've seen this in other businesses, right? So it, to, start, to stay in my Dutch uh, context, you have uh, payment, you have ATN, right? It's also API driven. You have... Uh, for Surge, Elastic, open source, by the way, pretty, pretty cool company. Uh, message boards for communication channels. And all of this, the, the, the common thing is that all of this API-driven integration, what does this mean? You can take it across channels, across different platforms. And I think that's the biggest development now. So you don't have to get a separate app and your users and everybody is forced into it. You can really put it into your products in a quicker way. 
Um, so yeah, that's pretty exciting. Make, makes the technology accessible, not only for like the top Fortune 500 and you know uh, big uh, nonprofits and NGOs, but let's say uh, much more broadly. So, but maybe Melinda can add something to it. She probably uh, even knows better. So. <laughs> No, I mean, absolutely, I agree. I, I think more and more things are becoming more and more accessible to companies who want to implement, implement more complex technologies. And absolutely, uh, the more things become somewhat universal in their transference or use, you know, the, the more adaptation you can see and the more value it also provides the user. Um, I, I think as well with, with gamification, you know, one of the, the big things with technology that we also have to account for is, is a bit the ethics of it as well. You know, yes, as you know, tracking or monitoring becomes more accessible to people or there, there's different uh, levels of nuance you can start to learn and different types of data you can collect, you know, one of along with this like super cool technological advancement is also this responsibility to say, okay, you know, where, where do we draw some of these lines in the design? You know, where do we implement something or, you know, where maybe we don't use this data in this way, you know? And I think that that's something with the, you know, it's, it's this two sides of the coin, you know, on one hand, it's absolutely incredible that more people can do what they want to do with this technology. They can be more nuanced about it. They can recognize people, they can customize for things. But on this other side, you know, it's a, it's a, yeah, it's a, it's a challenge because it's not really, yeah, it's technically possible. So do you do it? Do you not? It's, it's not regulated. And I think that that's a, a, always, there's, there's always those two sides to, to this type of tech advancement and gamification. Yeah, Mola, yeah, from a product think, manager perspective, yeah. I would love yeah, to I, 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 I agree totally with it. And I think that's the point of like being at a stage where you're like well above like a first adoption phase where it's like the question where you have to convince people. I think everybody knows what somewhat, at least what it does, everybody experiences. I mean, Miesko already mentioned it with Reddit, like he, he works in that space and like, I want to say still buys those tokens, but it just shows like we just come into contact in our everyday life. Everybody's using social media. Everybody uses like online learning tools, uh, uses Reddit, whatever, right? Like everybody comes into contact with this gamification methods that are used at frequent flyer miles, everything, right? Like all of those concepts we are familiar with. So I think we're at a stage where you don't have to convince people anymore to use it, but it's more the question, are we ready for it? Can we introduce it internally? And what do we want to reach? So yes, I think that that is the, the, the really the key part here um, that you need to get, like, that you need to uh, discuss for yourself, like, to answer the question if you want to do it or not like what do we want to reach what's the value of it and like i guess like we, like think about what can be first steps like can we introduce it under the water first can we do it like step by step and gain a benefit by first getting this value system without introducing it to like to the general audience of your solution so um, I think those are like really interesting points to discuss when you're thinking about implementing it or not. But especially now with, let's say, more of the like really implementation product design when it comes down, for example, to thanks, right? Using blockchain technologies and more how to implement this with open social and everything how do you decide like Marinda said like what is included what is not um what is big what technology is best used for the purpose of that we're trying to achieve right um me from Moet Miesko who would like to start but like really with the API and blockchain technologies kind of like changing the game of gamification and how do you kind of choose why did you choose let's say blockchain and like how did it lead now to online community engagement and implementing into open social Which... maybe I can mention it very quickly then I will give the word to Zach because you know he has a um he knows why he chose uh, yeah. for this type of solution, <laughs> yeah. the best. But you know, from my perspective, the best reason, like that's easy to explain, is that it's it's easy to use cross-platform, right? Mm -hmm. So, it, so blockchain is an open ledger, so it's quite easy to, you know, it's like a spreadsheet everybody could look into. Uh, so you can look into it from different, uh, you know, software um, tools or whatever, and this means that you can apply it across different platforms. So it doesn't lock you in. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and I think this, you know, 
gives a lot of possibilities now that everybody works on several different social platforms on his phone, laptop, everything. Uh, you can also scan QR codes in real life quite easily nowadays. Um, so that, that's, that's it for me. And uh, Zach, Zach, I know at UNDP we have some deeper uh, vision of this, but I'll uh, let Zach explain. Maybe that's uh, the best. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, before I get to that, I was going to make a joke that the other day I kept telling myself I, I need to say we're not going to monitor your activity on the system. We need to reward your activity. It's just back to the being responsible side of things. I, literally, I just kept on saying, oh, yeah, we're going to monitor everybody and what they're doing. <laughs> yeah. um, uh, but now in terms of why we chose the system, I mean, partially, I think, thanks to Maritz and Miesco and Open Social in that way of just introducing the the possibility of this. Um, we always knew that we did want to take some step towards gamification. It was always sort of the, and, and meaning like truly focusing on it, but it was always that sort of longer term, not quite the most important thing. Um, conceptual was out there a little bit and how do we really like sharpen it and get there. And this has just been an opportunity to, to make makes it much easier basically to start to, start to think about that. Um, from the side of like what what is UNDP looking into this? What is Sparkle as a platform looking into this for? Um, I mean, I think it is first and foremost. It, it is about celebrating community interaction. Um, the concept of community interaction in a policy space is still really difficult. There's a lot of silos. There's a lot of um, maybe explain shortly like what Sparkle maybe is just for everyone yeah. listening uh, yeah, that sure. they understand why it's silos Greg created and so forth. Yeah, so, so Spark Blue is a, is a community engagement platform where we have um, pretty specific groupings of communities that, are, that exist. So UNDP is a 20,000 person organization. It's a hybrid system that allows internal communication and collaboration. So we have some modules and, and e-discussions and crowdsourcing tools and course tools and other things to help internal learning and knowledge sharing. Um, that's really difficult in a big organization. We have presence all over the world, different countries, country offices, regions. And I'm in New York at, at, at HQ. There's there's a HQ versus country imbalance sometimes, all of the above. Um, and then it's a hybrid system in a way that we also can use the same platform to reach out to external partners. So other sectors, uh, civil society, private sector, government, um, and I think we've really nicely organized a system where we can have both the internal conversations and not be interrupted by the external and then also host the, host the um, external conversations as well on the same platform, allow the user to, to go into both spaces on the same platform. Um, so what we're sort of looking for, what we're super interested in in this, in this setting is one, we see that people go to a specific place on, on the system. Like we can see it in the Google analytics. We know that people go to a specific discussion, drop their comments in because maybe somebody even asked them to, maybe a manager asked them to, um, or, or it's just that they're, they are a substantive expert in, the, in that field and they participated there, but then we don't see a lot of continuing to explore on the system. We don't, we don't see them exploring other communities, joining other communities, um, the true sort of informal collaboration, I guess, there, like the informal knowledge sharing is not currently truly happening on the system. Um, we have been very successful at getting a good amount of very targeted interaction and very targeted outcomes, but, the, but that wider sense of continue to explore, how do we, how do we sort of focus on that? Um, from a site manager side, I guess a couple additional interesting points. One is just, and it's maybe similar in a way, just just about on, onboarding a new user to the system. How do you um, just present to the user different opportunities and options? I think that's sort of related there. Um, and to get to, and truly, uh, yeah, not, not to monitor your community, but to, but to get to know them, um, get, get to know a bit better, like what is actually working? It's It's just another data point that's, different than analytics, it's different than the engagement stats that you can pull from the system. This is truly a bit more maybe going to give you a, an idea of what is the, the popular interaction type or what really is sort of resonating maybe with, with communities or different communities and, ha and, um, and how do the, you use that to really get them to collaborate with, with one another. 
Yeah. Maybe, oh, go ahead. Us, yeah, maybe from 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 our from the product side um, to to complement this because uh, I mean op, the UN is using op social in that case and for us was like why we try to uh, do this with a blockchain technology and not only using like classical gamification parts is um, I think a lot of the components that Zach already mentioned there that you have like the UNDP is a very big department and I think Miasco also mentioned it already that you can use this open ledger system to transport it to different um, to different communities and to create like a sort of reputational system around it um, which is super interesting especially also for us as a product because we do have like clients with a lot of instances greenpeace had, has national regional um uh platforms the un has a lot of different topical platforms that are like smaller off branches basically of spark blue and uh like all those actions that Zach mentioned to get to know the people, see what works, that can be obviously in some way transported to related platforms and creating this this ecosystem of a uh, reputational system that can be transferred from one one uh, platform to another is I think something that can be a game changer gamification because at the moment it is like very incremental and very much focused on one platform but if you look at like how gamification or reputation is working like in, in the real world like you also have those same structures there right like if I say something and people laugh I get like social rewards for that right and at one point I come into a room and people are like oh this is well it's like he's a funny guy right so the same simple structure that you see in real life you can you can basically transport like or we are trying at least at some point to transport into a digital space so I think this is this is something that's really not existent at the moment and that is a huge uh, huge opportunity to grow into and I think where blockchain can play a vital role um, representing this real community engagement and real reputation that you acquire in the real world rep helping it represent in a, in a digital space yeah just Quickly to build on that there, I think what we tr what we really see now is more of a transactional interaction. Like people do come to the space and it's about, okay, you, maybe they get something out of it, but it is sort of a one-time transaction. Um, we do have these sort of satellite platforms as well and, and, and take it a different level. We also have other UN agencies that are also interested in the use of Spark Blue. They, they're sort of testing it out. They have like maybe one discussion, some little community that they're just getting to know um, what the power of this type of technology is. And that idea of reputation of bringing your reputation from one place to the next, whether, okay, it's with the internal UNDP conversations to a more external environment, to a different agency environment, um, I think can be super, super powerful. That's, that's relatively long-term away. And I think gonna be really complicated to get get it right in terms of what does that mean? How do you truly measure reputation in a digital sense on, on a system? But um, I think has a, has a lot of potential here to sort of start to break down those silos and start to bring in, I guess, the right expertise and or reputation immediately to a conversation rather than getting to know somebody over time. I, I have actually a quick question not to take on your job, Jamila, but oh, um, to, to Melinda about this, because like Miesko, Zach, and I have obviously like uh, some, some business uh, personal components, why we are interested in blockchain and integrating those. Uh, I think we laid out a little bit the vision for this, but like Melinda, do you see like this connection being made in other examples or clients you are having? Um, yeah, I mean, absolutely. Like, I think anytime anyone's looking for something that's, again, a, like you're saying, a transferable source that's verified, that has some substantial backing behind it, I, I think, you know, that that absolutely, uh, you know, it is, is a huge advantage. You know, I think sometimes, um, uh, you know, at least we saw this with a lot of like point reward systems is what can also happen though, as you start to get into sort of the battle of the different systems or, or like, okay, which uh, point system do you want to collect your rewards on? Or, you know, how could these potentially transfer? And at the beginning, typically there's more universal ones, but there might be two variety. But I think especially within specific organizations or within specific communities or a specific platform, the transferring of things from one separate instance to another is, is 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 super super useful in gamification because 
that is a, a challenge whenever you build a new system is you have to uh, reintegrate the user into how that specific environment works or build something back up again because you're like, all right, we don't know who you are. Yes, your friends know you're funny for like that example, but how do we how do we transfer that vouching over? And, and many systems have tried to do that, but I, I do think that, you know, if that additional level of verification and, and, and more of an ease of transference into uh, a system like that, um, it definitely, uh, yeah, gives a lot of, of interesting possibilities uh, for the future with that. Yeah. We also have an interesting question regarding that also from like Dennis who said, is it okay kind of to redesign the system or introduce new incentives and new badges in like the middle of the experience? And like, how can that cause also problems then for the users, for example? Yeah, I mean, uh, absolutely you can. And this is something that if, if you look at games, you know, games periodically release even new major outcomes of the game, you know, where all of a sudden five new levels are possible or a new world uh, opens up. I mean, I think whenever it comes to tinkering with the system, uh, the goal is to build the basic system in at the core, do things in the world that generates sort of impact or feedback. Mm -hmm. It's there are specific labels for this impact or feedback and you try to build it in a way that you could build content in later on, you know, as long as it's not, you know, uh, just a fundamental shift or constantly things are appearing, you can always release new packages, new chapters. You just have to build that into that narrative and, and make sure people can follow how you got there. And I think that's when like things are issued too frequently or people start to get confused. It's when they can't really place why this appeared. They can't really figure out how it fits into the system they grew to know. And if it starts to behave like that, then yes, you might have an adaptation issue. But if it fits with what they know and what they're used to, it, it shouldn't be much of a problem as long as you acknowledge the change or acknowledge uh, the, the new content. Yeah. yeah maybe add, add, Go ahead, Nesco. I'll keep it short. Yeah, so maybe to add to what Melinda said, it might, might be even better, right? To, introduced to keep it very simple at the beginning and to not overcomplicate it and also to keep it authentic, right? So the first group of users to not rely on incentives too much, right? To attract them or, or get the community going. Um, but then when you, you know, understand what the community is about, what the game is about, the app is about, then to add uh, incentives to give it a boost. So, so Zach. No, I was going to say definitely on the side of keeping it simple to start. That's, I think, nice in general, always to see how it works and, and scale from there. But going back to one of the questions just about tech in general is that um, I think we definitely plan on being flexible. And I think the, the tech and, and the, the way that we're going to set this up will allow us to make decisions in the at launch and then post launch, um, always introducing them in a way that's strategic and, and thought out. But but I don't think we're going to have a roadmap or a plan from start to finish. Uh, I think we'll be iterating on this for, for quite some time and, and revisiting in phases and yeah, introducing new, new options for the community. Yeah, I agree. I think um, what, what everybody said is completely correct. It's always like MVP approaches help. Uh, we are actually in this project, like introducing it underwater first to see like, is the concept working for us and for the people who are managing the community and then only introducing it to a broader audience. But I think that also ties the question itself and the discussion ties back to blockchain, to an aspect of blockchain that we didn't talk about yet, which is, um, that like you have a governance aspect in blockchain, right? Like finding out what creates this value, as Melinda said, is, uh, is, is part that can be done in blockchain in a really interesting way because it democratizes a process that is usually done top down that where like a small set of people determines Oh, okay, this is value for our community, but actually blockchain, yes, we can truly explain that a little bit further. The concept has like voting systems um, uh, where you can introduce new rewards, where you can determine how much is a reward worth. And this is, I think, something that uh, adds again as the transferability adds a whole other dimension that only with or specifically with blockchain is possible um, in, in, in a gamification construct. Yeah, absolutely. So what Moritz mentioned uh, definitely is possible. And there are a couple of uh, examples already in the world of quite big 
well, you could call it organization, but it's also not like there. So there is not a central entity anymore, but there are like individuals who are like self-managing either funds or, or try to achieve some certain goals. And it works surprisingly well. Oh, you know, one have to say it also sometimes melts down, right? When you, when these incentives are not aligned or there is maybe too much money on the table or, uh, or bad actors. Uh, but there are quite a few, I will not mention them today because that's not what the session is about, but um, there are quite a uh, few examples of this actually working in real life. And this is really exciting. So it's not about the rules that are introduced top down, but you know the community actually comes up with their own rules after a while, right? And they, they can vote in the new rules. And from that moment, that's, that's how the new reward works or the new incentive. So that's super, uh, super cool. Yeah. Is that also the reason, um, uh, Zach, that the UNDP uh, like chose also uh, implementation of this gamification as it provides like transparency and de uh, decentralization, which protects kind of user data? Um, I wouldn't say per se that, but it's definitely, a, you know, it's it it's makes it more attractive in that way. Um, the yeah again like the the amount of users that we have here or and even beyond that i think we're sort of just hitting the cusp of that the amount of potential community of users that we do have um allowing them to sort of seamlessly come into something that 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 has these sort of built-in not incentives but built-in avenues to take different directions to go um as miesco was saying the um the idea that a crowd can make something pretty stable over time is, is sort of the idea here is that yeah. we're bringing people from a lot of the, the same, okay, the same field for the most part of the same ambition, but quite a few different uh, walks of life and backgrounds, et cetera. And then, yeah, there's, there's, there's a chance to have something sp sprout here that, that, that is kind of builds itself. Yeah. Yeah. Super great. Um, since we are coming a little bit also closer, I have one final question to all of you uh, before we go to the Q&A. Um, and I was super interesting to know, what are you working on currently that makes you most excited about the future of gamification? Um, who would like to start? <laughs> uh, I'll start with Moritz since he's on mute. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, I mean, uh, currently, really gamification-wise, we are working uh, with things, which is super interesting. But for me, as a as a product product uh, manager for uh, community software, I think I actually was just answering one of the questions there, which ties perfectly in it. <laughs> is like the possibility of what we already touched upon is um, the of of adding uh, advanced like management rights towards the system. So going beyond badges and recognition systems, which I think are have a place, like we're brushing this down here, but I, I mean, they, they can be really valuable and really powerful, but from a site manager perspective, looking into, um, okay, I see this person has in a certain topical area, a lot of expertise gets, creates apparently a lot of value for other people, gathers a lot of points, gathers, like gets this insight based on the value system that I as a community manager defined. And then I can pull this person up. And I mean, this is also like part of the, the, the title here of this whole uh, whole panel is like how you can create super users. And this is like, I guess, like a big part of it is like not only fostering uh, positive reinforcement and fostering engagement with it, but like actually rewarding those people with additional content, with courses, with, uh, with moderation rights, like giving them the appreciation in a way where you can give them more trust, more freedom, more impact in how they can create their community and pull them in as like actual leaders and, and people who, who take over some work for you as community managers. So I think this is a concept that I'm super interested in that I'm really looking forward to test and to apply and to, to, to really work on how, how you can fine tune this, obviously also against risk of abuse and so forth. Yeah. Uh, Zach, what about you? How, what are you excited about now with the implementation also? Yeah, I think um, in, in a way I'm a numbers guy, so I'm honestly just looking forward to tweaking the values. <laughs> so there's, I can think of maybe 10, 20 different actions that you can take on SparkBlue. You can log in, create a profile, join a community, join a specific discussion, follow, follow a taxonomy, follow an event, join an event, all of the above, all, the, all these different things. Um, 
And that's just the first layer of it. Then you have the second layer of interaction between different users. And that's where you get to some reputation angle. Like what happens if a user with a relatively high reputation score interacts with another one versus um, versus somebody who is new to the community that, that doesn't have any any record at all, any, any, any record of actions yet. I just think, yeah, that, that big web of, of relationships and numbers is going to be just kind of fun. I think we'll make a lot of mistakes, but in, in the same time. <laughs> So you learn like, from all of them <laughs> yeah, and, and, and then that introduction just in, in, in like as Merit said first we're just going to do some monitoring on the back end but then when we do start to introduce this to um to the actual community I said monitoring again <laughs> so, <is that> <laughs> <laughs> we're gonna yeah, yeah, I need to, I need yeah. To work well let's that. point it uh, at you he's like he heard it <laughs> Uh, but I think I think when we do truly introduce that this is a concept that is happening on the system to the rest of our audience, see how see how that changes or see see how we build upon that. And and from my my side, I think that's gonna be something that we'll do really, really slowly and and, and see make sure that we do it right and and, and in yeah. a way that, that the community really does embrace, I guess. And yeah. Yeah. What about you, Melinda, coming also away a bit from, you know, the open social talk, but about you gamification, I know you also started another uh, company as well, but are you trying to both and how are you though excited now with gamification and all the changes being in the industry for so long? Yeah, I mean, uh, one of the things I'm very excited about is a bit of the uh, step away from it's just mechanics, it's just this plug and play and, and realizing that a lot of these projects weren't as successful because people weren't treating it as a serious design process. So I, I think that that's, that's one of the, the things I'm most excited about because, you know, uh, to, to echo, uh, as I said earlier, is it really allows more autonomy for the users. And what I'm really excited about is more and more gamification projects are allowing people to just be empowered. You know, the gamification systems help collect input from people to then help you know use a system to generate what would be a next logical next step and uh, yeah with, with our new project Perkio we're really looking at uh, you know how can we use gamification to make it easier for people to basically receive help and initiatives that would help them with their well-being you know how can we use this more as a matching system as a way of communicating some of these uh, you know relatively not simple concepts to them in a way that's really approachable and I think that gamification has so much more potential about bringing people into these narratives and helping guide them through it but still trusting them that you know that the system's not built because we think people don't want to engage it's built to give them that doorway to understand how to engage or to understand what's going to happen when they do and I think we really need to keep emphasizing that you know, we, we show up at work because we want to be there. You know, we are on a community because we care about it and have our systems trust that more and be designed to trust that more than, than before. But I think we are going there sort of as a, a, as a group, sort of collective yeah. mind, more and more projects are leaning in that direction. Yeah. One of them being Mesco, right? Leading towards that direction. Well, how, what about you? How what are you excited about now with the implementation also with the blockchain? Yeah, I completely agree with Melinda. And but it's, you know, in practical terms, we um, we've been talking about giving rewards a lot uh, today, right? But uh, what I'm excited about is also I have a new um, use case coming up that's more about that you not only reward users but they can spend their rewards in a way as well. So this specific one will be that people can, uh, let's say, order courses, online courses with their points. So it's like the e-learning, you could say. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that, that's super cool. So, so make it more circular, right? Mm -hmm. So it's not only one way. Um, and, and something, you know, that's important for us, but it's more like midsummer time. So, but, uh, you know, working hard to get there. It's also mm -hmm. to use real money for uh, some monetized rewards, you know? Yeah. So uh, euros or dollars in our case. I think that's going to also be exciting. Um, mm -hmm. There is a bit more regulation in that space as well from uh, financial yeah. uh, authorities. So, so we have to be careful. But, uh, you know, I think it's also very yeah. uh, exciting stuff. Mm -hmm. And it also ties, just to wrap it up, to what Christian is asking yeah. in the Q&A. So, yes, uh, there are currencies definitely created by companies. I know that PayPal uh, experimented with this in a major bank as well, I think. 
So e-learning is especially one, which is quite effective. So getting people to follow courses with their points and also unique rewards were quite successful. I think PayPal did stuff like you can have a karate lesson with your CFO or something really, really out there. But, you know, uh, that's really fun. That's more like a team building or like company culture thing. So um, I think, that, yeah, again, those are quite interesting areas uh, worth exploring. Yeah. Yeah, we're speaking of the Q&A, if someone still has a question, someone already sent in a question that I will ask as well regarding they want to get a little bit of more experience. Ona, I hope I'm saying this right. Uh, they have been prototyping with their e-learning platform, which has gamified elements. The feedback is showing that some users right really love it, enjoy it. Others think it's super confusing. They don't can't really navigate it. It is the better. Uh, the question is, is it better to keep the gamified part more simple? Um, will some people never find value in it uh, instead or instead make it more like optional rather than mandatory or to move it up to a different level, for example? So I think a part of it actually has been answered by by, by Miesko already mm -hmm. to say with the part of it that um, ideally uh, community existence rights comes from an intrinsic level rather than like the gamification grind or something mm -hmm. like this. So I think it should be always optional. Um, there are some components that you want to integrate like really deeply even maybe if the user doesn't know it but like participation in it should be always like optional because in the moment you force people into it it becomes like that it becomes a chore and it takes away a little bit of like a extra component that you want with gamification a joy from it and a and a and a rewarding feeling um, and what you ideally want to have um, and i think in the end like yes i think truly because it's optional and because not everybody responds to it, uh, probably some people won't find it rewarding or won't be in more engaged by it. So I think it is a fact that you have to accept that you won't get everybody on board with this kind of features, ideally a lot. And ideally you get more value out of it. We talked about this by creating your own value system, by getting more insight into user behavior and such. But um, maybe, yeah, not, not everybody will respond to it positively. Yeah, uh, since we are right on the dot even here, if anyone has more questions uh, also towards each uh, guest panel, you know, you can always reach out on LinkedIn or also on, our, on the event itself, write a comment. Uh, they are on it and we'll be writing back. Any uh, more information, you can email each person within this call as well. As mentioned, it will be recorded and found on Community Talks, which is where the event was placed as well. I hope everyone learned just as much as I did <laughs> and had just as much much fun. Uh, thank you really all for joining. Also, Melinda, Miesko, Zach, and Moritz. It was really great. Thank you so much. And thank you, everyone else, for joining. I wish you all a lovely afternoon. And uh, see you. And take care. Bye. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, everybody.